say it again, it's the hungry that come out, hallelujah, on, uh, on Wednesday night. So I'm glad that you're here tonight. And tonight we're going to continue studying the sevenfold spirit of God. And I hope that you've been enjoying this series in the Lord. Now, the Lord had told me that we were going to study the sevenfold spirit of God again. I didn't know when. I knew it was going to be this year. Uh, but the Lord had, had led us in a, a brief teaching on the Holy Spirit now that has led into uh, the full study of the sevenfold spirit of God. It's a year of new beginnings in the Lord. It's a time of transition in the Lord. It's a time where God is doing new things and he's taking us to new places. Do you believe that tonight? And so now is a time that we want to make sure that we do not resist the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is bringing many of us through a lot of change in this season. Uh, if it's not a change of location, if it's not a change of vocation, <laughs> Uh, it, it's the, the change of letting go and surrendering to him. Um, we've got some in our church that are going through a change of location right now, moving, and, and it's, a, it's a geographic move. Uh, we've got some that are about to go through a vocational change, uh, like Dana, and is believing God for a new job opportunity. But what I believe God is doing in, in most of us within this body is that God is wanting to take us to a deeper realm and a deeper place in Him, which always requires a deeper level of surrender. It's like you hear me say all the time, first comes the knowledge, then comes the test. Let me say that again. First comes the knowledge, then comes the test. What is knowledge? It's knowing. It's knowing. So the deeper we go in knowing Jesus, then the greater some of the tests become. And I think the greatest test is our will versus God's will. And learning to surrender our will to his. Like Jesus in the garden that night in the place of the crushed olive Gethsemane, the Lord said, Father, if it's your will, let this cup pass from me. But nevertheless, Father, not my will but thine be done. That's the heart of God. That's the heart of God, that as we go deeper in the Lord, that we continue to surrender more of us and receive more of him, that he would increase and we would decrease. In church, that's what we call change. How many are willing to receive that? What did the Lord say in his earthly ministry? He said, unless we're willing to become like little children and change, we'll never see the kingdom of God. So this season is all about change. If it's not location, if it's not vocation, it's God changing us and surrendering our will to his. Do you believe that? Do you believe that in the Lord? Hallelujah. It's the year 5778 in the Hebrew, and it is a year of change in the Lord. Hallelujah. Do you receive that tonight? Amen. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 11 if you have the word with you tonight. Isaiah chapter 11, and I want to encourage you uh, to allow the Holy Spirit to give you, as we talk about the Holy Spirit, a greater desire to know the Holy Ghost. I'm going to say this again. Many churches really teach relationship with only one aspect of who God is. Now, many times if we look at, let's say, the Catholic Church, so to speak, we see relationship with the Father. And aren't you glad about what Jesus did for us? If we look in other denominations, the Baptist denominations and others, it's all about relationship with Jesus. When we get into some of the Spirit-filled denominations, even the Pentecostal church and other churches, we see such a powerful, powerful relationship with the Holy Spirit. I believe if we're really going to walk in balance, we should have relationship with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I think that needs to be taught more in the church. And I believe that as we really begin to walk in relationship with the totality of the Trinity, I believe then when God speaks, we're going to be able to discern that's the Father speaking. That's the Son speaking. That's the Holy Spirit speaking. How many are willing to receive that tonight? That we can begin to then tell by the way that the Lord speaks which aspect of God is speaking to us. 
Well, Pastor, I don't know about all that. Well, you know what? God wants you to know. (laughs) And God wants you to go deeper. What did the Lord Jesus say? He said, my sheep hear my voice. The sheep hear the voice of the shepherd. And another shepherd, they will not follow. How many are willing to receive that? So how many know when we hear the voice of our shepherd, then we don't follow another shepherd? Which is why it's so important to hear the voice of God, to practice the presence of God, to listen to God. How many know that God will speak more than just through his word? God can speak into our spirit. God can speak to us through other people. God can speak to us through circumstances. But there's nothing like when God speaks to us directly and when God calls us by name. Do you receive that in the Lord tonight? There's nothing like Mary being at the tomb and she says to who she assumes to be the gardener, where have they taken my Lord so that I can go and get him and bring him back? She doesn't realize it's Jesus because she's blinded by her own expectation. And what does the word say? Jesus simply looked at her and said, Mary. In the moment he called her name, she cried out to him, Rabboni, do you receive that tonight? Hallelujah. So if you receive that tonight in the Lord, let's stand up. We're going to give this time in the word to him and just get ready for a manna fest in the Lord tonight. Hallelujah. Lord Jesus, as we look in your word tonight, we ask that you would reveal yourself to us in the word. For Lord, you are the word made flesh. And Lord, we love it when we're studying the word and you walk into the room and you reveal yourself to us. Holy Spirit, I ask tonight for those in the sanctuary and those that are going to listen via Ustream and YouTube, I ask, Holy Spirit, that you would give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation that we might know Jesus more. But Holy Spirit, not only that we might know Jesus more, we want to know you, Holy Spirit. We want to know you, Abba Father. So God, have your way in this place tonight. We love you, God. And God, we ask that you would just pour yourself out upon us tonight. Lord, it's the hungry that come out on Wednesday nights. Lord, I declare over this group tonight, bless are those who do hunger and thirst for righteousness sake, for they shall be filled. And Holy Spirit, we just cry out to you tonight that as we teach on you tonight, that Holy Spirit, that this would be taught the way that you want this to be taught. And Holy Spirit, may your presence increase in the room as we teach on you tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Hallelujah. Let's stand or continue to stand as we look at the main passage tonight. Isaiah chapter 11. The word says in verse 1, and this is a review passage for us. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. And from its roots a branch will bear fruit. And the spirit of the Lord will rest upon him. Who is the him? The him is Messiah, Yeshua the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth. So the spirit of the Lord will rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and the spirit of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of power, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. Please be seated tonight. How many know if the Lord Jesus himself delighted in the fear of the Lord? we should delight in the fear of the Lord. Amen? Hallelujah. Let's continue tonight to talk about the Holy Spirit. In review, we've talked about the fact that in the Old Testament, many times the Holy Spirit was called Roha Kodesh, or more typically in the Hebrew, Rach, Racha Kodesh, literally meaning the Spirit of God or the Spirit of Yahweh. Or another translation would be the Spirit of Holiness or the Spirit of the Holy Place. So the Holy Spirit very much in the Old Testament was associated with a meeting place. So when the children of Israel were traveling in the wilderness, they had the tabernacle. And it was believed that the Holy Spirit would fill 
the tabernacle, the spirit of the holy place. In fact, the word of God says Joshua was a man of a different spirit and he would stay in the tabernacle until every bit of the presence of Roha Kodesh had lifted. Isn't that amazing? Solomon builds his temple and the Holy Spirit falls upon the temple. The Holy Spirit would fall upon the temple so mightily that the word says the priests couldn't even perform their duties. So many times in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit was associated with a meeting place of God or was associated with coming upon people when a certain anointing or power was needed. David would go into battle, and as he went into battle, the Spirit of the Lord would come upon him, and nobody could beat him in battle when the Spirit of God was upon him. How many want that same anointing? Amen? Hallelujah. So, Racha Kodesh. Now, it's interesting that term Rach does not refer to a person. That term rach, which sounds a lot like rock, refers to a force like the wind. And the Hebrews believe that the Holy Spirit is, would be felt, would be experienced, but not seen. Isn't that interesting? Felt and experienced, but not seen, a lot like the wind. How many are willing to receive that? A lot like the wind. Now, Rach Ha Kodesh, Ha in the Hebrew can mean a uh, or the, but it's also interesting that sometimes in the, in the Hebrew you'll see that word Ha, and that's a word almost like an exclamation point, so to speak. Like in the English, you've got the Ha! Well, many times in the Hebrew, that ha was very expressive in the Lord. And sometimes I've been in rooms and services where the Holy Spirit falls, and literally you'll hear a ha ha or a hey hey in the Lord, interestingly enough. And the word kodesh literally means the state or the quality of being holy. So when we put this all together, Rach Kodesh, literally we have the force of God that's like the wind that comes unexpectedly, the Ha, and is holy. Isn't that interesting? Now we've got to keep in mind that in the Old Testament or Old Covenant, this was a society or this was a covenant of the visitation of God we've got to remember this as God's people God would come and visit the Holy Spirit would come and rest upon the tabernacle but God would then leave remember Abraham he said to God he said God don't pass me by <laughs> hallelujah he knew when God showed up this was so very something very special when God showed up but how many know as we get into the new covenant as the blood of Jesus was shed and the curtain was rent, no longer did we have a covenant of visitation. We have a covenant of habitation. And now the very Raha Kodesh that would come upon people would now dwell within us. Man, how many are thankful for the new covenant? That's why the book of Hebrews says that the new covenant is the superior covenant. Why? It's not a covenant of visitation. It's a covenant of habitation. Why? Because the old covenant was all about what we did. The new covenant is all about what God did for us. How many are willing to receive that? In fact, the only way the new covenant could come forth was by an absolute miracle of God. Because when there was a covenant relationship in the Old Testament, it was two coming together, two or more, making a commitment. And if either side broke that commitment while they were alive, the consequence was death. That's why the word says what? The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. How many are willing to receive that tonight? So how is the new covenant possible? Jesus came as a man to fulfill the man side of the covenant. 
Jesus came as God to fulfill the God side of the covenant. Therefore, that covenant can never be broken or revoked or nullified because God fulfilled both sides. That's why the new covenant isn't about what we do. The new covenant is about what Jesus did and what we can become through what Jesus did. Now, we don't want to look at this one dimensionally because there's people that believe because the new covenant was all about what Jesus did, therefore it's not about what I do, therefore I can do anything I want to do because of the blood. That's not balanced teaching. And I've met Christians who do whatever they want to do and they'll just say, well, it's under the blood. It's under the blood. It's under the blood. How many know that that's not balance? There's no fear of the Lord in that. There's no repentance in that. So what we have to understand when we're really looking at this, hallelujah, how many are excited about the Lord tonight? I mean, this is good stuff. So what we have to understand is the new covenant is all about what Jesus did, but now how we can die like he died so that we can be raised in him and become what we never could have become without him. What did Paul say with Christ? He said, I died with Christ and I was raised with Christ. So the the grace of the new covenant is not an excuse or a covering for sin. Come on now. The grace of the new covenant is the ability to overcome sin for us to become like Jesus now, which we never really could have done before on our own. Is anybody excited about the Lord? And how did God ensure that this would be possible for us? His son not only died, but then Jesus, the son, sent the Holy Spirit. And now the Holy Spirit leads us through not only the drawing to the Lord so that we're saved, but also through the process of sanctification where we learn how to die and then he fills us with the anointing and the glory of God. Hallelujah. So the Holy Spirit leads us through the aspects of the covenant. Are you willing to receive that? So when we want to walk in relationship with the Spirit of God, we're not only going to walk in the anointing of the Holy Ghost, the gift of the Holy Ghost, we should also be willing to walk in the conviction of the Holy Spirit and the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Is anybody getting this? Because if we walk in the anointing of the Holy Spirit but not the fruits of the Spirit, we're going to be in trouble. And I've seen a lot of folks out there walking in the gifts, but they don't have love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, kindness, meekness, and self-control. And I tell you what, they're angry prophets and unbalanced people, and we don't want to be like that. Can I hear an amen? Now, there's time prophets get angry, but there's a difference between the flesh side of it and God being angry, and God is perfect when he's angry, amen? So we've got to see it for what it is. We need to not only flow in the Spirit, but we need to surrender to the conviction of the Holy Spirit. We need to not only flow in the gifts, but we need to flow in the fruits of the Spirit, because the fruits of the Spirit keep the gifts of the Spirit in check. Oh, we should get an amen on that one. Hallelujah. I think we should, we should cry out to God for the fruits of the Spirit before we ever seek the gifts of the Spirit. Is anybody willing to receive that? But what do we want to do the moment people get saved? We want them to get filled with the gifts, or with the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I think maybe we should pray for the fruits first. <laughs> Hallelujah. Get, pray, that, pray that they get fruity right away in the Lord. I think that's what we need. Hallelujah. Well, as we were talking about the Holy Spirit last week, we began to talk about the sevenfold Spirit of God, and we began to talk about the various aspects of the Holy Spirit. And in review, quickly, we saw in Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 2, the word says, the Spirit of the Lord will rest upon him. The Spirit of the Lord is the Holy Spirit. Can I hear an amen? Amen. The Spirit of the Lord is the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit brings what I like to call the divine enabling. The divine enabling. Jesus' ministry did not begin until he was baptized in the Jordan by John. 
And the Holy Spirit descended upon him like a dove. Is anybody getting this? Jesus' earthly ministry did not begin until he was filled with the Holy Spirit. Now we had the establishing of two witnesses there at the Jordan. Everything is established on the testimony of two witnesses. The Holy Spirit came upon Jesus and the Father spoke and said, This is my Son in whom I am well pleased. That's when Jesus' ministry began. In the Old Testament, no one could walk in a ministry unless there were two people that would verify or testify for that person. Isn't that interesting? So we saw the testimony, the verification of Jesus there at the Jordan River. The Holy Spirit descended upon him like a dove and the Father spoke, this is my Son in whom I am well pleased. Can I hear an amen? Now when we begin to get filled with the Holy Spirit and begin to walk in relationship with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit releases the anointing over us. Again, I like to call the anointing divine enabling. What does it mean? Through the anointing of the Holy Spirit, we can do what we could never do before. And that anointing is like oil. It's like oil. One of the names for the Messiah in the Old Testament was Masak, and that literally meant the anointed one. The anointed one. Now, those of you that have ever worked with oil, whether ladies, it's olive oil in the kitchen, or guys, it's uh, motor oil in the garage, you know that a couple drops of oil can go a long ways. Especially in the garage, you're working on a vehicle, you spill just a little bit of oil. It looks like you just poured oil on that garage floor because oil does what? It, it spreads. It spreads. The anointing of the Holy Spirit is the masak or the oil, and that oil just pours over every single part of us. And not only every single part of us, we don't want to think that the anointing of the Holy Spirit stops at what we might think would be secular. What do you mean, Pastor? Well, the, the anointing, the divine enabling of the Holy Spirit isn't only there to anoint us to flow in the gifts. When we're believers and we're filled with the Holy Spirit and His divine enabling, the school teacher suddenly can teach even better. The businessman is even smarter in business. The salesperson can sell even more because of the divine enabling of the Holy Spirit. That divine enabling covers every area of our lives, not just what we consider, quote, spiritual. And I'll tell you what, I really believe that God considers things to be much more spiritual than what man does. I believe the dad interacting with his children in the anointing is a spiritual thing. I believe the way that we handle our finances is a spiritual thing. Is anybody receiving that? So when we receive the divine enabling of the Holy Spirit, that divine enabling covers every area of our lives. Is anybody getting that? Not just what we think is the spiritual stuff. It covers everything. You're at work and the copier's not working and you don't know how to fix a copier to save your life. But all of a sudden you think, well, this, well, this needs to happen and this drawer opened and this kind of cleaned a little bit and that done and you shut the doors, you do the cleaning and all of a sudden it fires right up. How in the world did that happen? The divine enabling of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. So when that oil hits you, it's like in the Old Testament, they'd hollow out the ram's horn and fill it with oil and pour it over the head. You know that oil then just went down and covered everything. That's also why it was believed that the hem of the garment of the priest contained healing and restoration and deliverance. Why? Because that hem in the collar of the robe would do what it would catch the oil as it poured down that's why the woman with the issue of blood wanted to do what amen touch the hem of his garment 
Why? Because she knew that's where the anointing was, so to speak. That's what was believed by Israel, that that collar cupped the oil, so that was where the anointing pooled. So, oh, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I'll be healed. Is that not powerful in the Lord? beautiful in the Lord and then the, the high priest in the Old Testament would have tassels hanging down then from the collar of the robes and it was believed that those tassels were anointed and holy hallelujah how many want more of the oil of the Holy Spirit the Masak hallelujah I believe the Holy Spirit loves it when we talk about the Holy Spirit now as we talk about the sevenfold Spirit of God Every time we wrap up talking about one of the folds of the Holy Spirit or manifestations of the Holy Spirit, we'll always talk about a key to flowing in that particular area. So a key to flowing in the power of the Holy Spirit, the anointing of the Holy Spirit, the Masak, is yieldedness to the Holy Spirit. The more you yield to the Holy Spirit, the greater the anointing that you're going to walk in. Does everybody receive that tonight? The more you yield to the Holy Spirit, the greater the anointing that you're going to walk in. How many know we can flip that around? The more you resist the Holy Spirit, the lesser the anointing that you're going to walk in. So your level of yieldedness to the Holy Spirit is in part going to determine the level of the anointing that you're going to walk in. Now you may say, but Pastor, wait a minute. The, the gifts are without repentance. Well, absolutely. I believe that. And I've seen some messed up people flowing in the anointing. But the way they're flowing messed up and unyielded is nothing compared to the way they would flow if they were yielded to the Holy Spirit and walking in the fruits of the Holy Spirit and not grieving the Holy Spirit. Does anybody catch what I'm saying with that? So we want to be yielded to the Holy Spirit. What does it mean to yield? Well, if we go up to, if we talk about driver's ed and we go up to a yield sign, what does that mean? It means we slow down at that place and take caution when we yield. So when we yield to the Holy Spirit, we slow down, we look, we listen to what the Holy Spirit's saying so that we can ensure or make sure we do it the Holy Spirit's way. See, when you flow in the divine enabling of the Holy Spirit, you're not flowing in your gifts. You're flowing in the Holy Spirit's gifts. And whenever I hear anyone talking about flowing in their gifts, I just want to stop them immediately and say, whoa, we need to get this right here. It's not your gift. The gifts belong to the Holy Spirit. Is anybody willing to receive that? They're given to us to accomplish the work of the kingdom. Amen? The gifts belong to the Holy Spirit. The kingdom belongs to our God. So we've got to see this for what it is. The gifts are for kingdom work. So when we're out in public and God gives you a prophetic word for somebody or a word of knowledge for somebody, it's not your word and it's not your prophecy. It belongs to the Lord. And when you go and tell that person what God says, it's about the kingdom. The moment it's about us in any way, we're not yielding to the Holy Spirit. Is anybody willing to receive that? The Lord Jesus said, as the Father sent me, so I send you. Which means what? He sends us anointed in the Holy Spirit, anointed to do the work of the kingdom. How many want to do the work of the kingdom? Hallelujah. Well, you're not going to do it without the anointing. <laughs> We're not going to do it without the anointing. That's why we really need to yield to the spirit of the living God. Can I hear an amen? So the word says in Isaiah 11 verse 2, the spirit of the Lord will rest upon him. Now I believe the word is very intentional. That when God gives us a list, he ordered the list. Do you believe that? The word says man plans, but God ordains his steps. God ordains it all. So notice the word says, the spirit of the Lord will rest upon him. The spirit of the Lord is whom? 
the Holy Spirit, amen, the Spirit of the living God, Roha Kodesh. Now the next manifestation of the Holy Spirit that we see is what? The Spirit of Wisdom, which I believe is saying to us that when we, when we, hallelujah, whoo, begin to be filled with the Spirit of the Lord, the very next thing that we need to be seeking from the Holy Spirit is the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because the wisdom of the Holy Spirit gives us counsel in every situation to know what to do, when to do it, and how to do it. So what is wisdom? Wisdom is like the owner's manual for the divine enabling. Wisdom is like the owner's manual for the divine enabling. Because what does wisdom do? It gives us counsel in every situation to know what to do, when to do it, and how to do it. So how many know when that divine enabling hits you, an anointing of prophecy is upon your life, and you've never prophesied before, what do you need? <laughs> you need the counsel of the Holy Spirit. The counsel of the Holy Spirit to know what? What to do with prophecy. When to prophesy. How to prophesy. Can I hear an amen? Now we live in a day and age where if we want to learn how to do something, we just grab a good Christian book on that topic. You know that's wonderful. And there's some great Christian books out there. I suggested one via email to Erica today. Because I thought it was a great book. It was on the seer anointing. Woohoo! Hallelujah! But I tell you what, whenever we want the owner's manual, we have the owner's manual here on the gifts. Can I hear an amen? But also, the word says that the Holy Spirit teaches us all things. So the Holy Spirit will teach us how to use the gifts. Are you willing to receive that? When you, when you read a book on the anointing, you are receiving second-hand rhema. Hallelujah. <laughs> what is second-hand rhema? Second-hand rhema is, is what God spoke to someone else. And they put it in a book. And you read it, and it's wonderful. But there's nothing like when God speaks it to you. Can I hear an amen? So I really believe when it comes to the owner's manual on divine enabling, we should go to the spirit to the school of the Holy Spirit first. Then look at what God has spoken to other people. The challenge is we could read five different books on prophecy and get five different ways to prophesy. But when we really listen to the Holy Spirit, what's going to happen? We're going to do it His way. And now grab a hold of this. When we do it the Holy Spirit's way, the Holy Spirit may say to do it one way in this situation and another way in a different situation. Well, Pastor, I don't know if, if I understand that or, or if I agree with that. Now, wait a minute. Look at the different ways that Jesus prayed for blind men to receive sight in the Word. I mean, the some, he just spoke to the eyes, to others. He put his hands on the eyes. To one guy, he spit on the ground and made a mud mixture and put it on his eyes. Come on now. And said, go wash. To another, he prayed for him a couple times because the first time he prayed for him, he asked him what he could see. And he said, well, I see men, but they look like trees. Anybody ever read that in the Word? So what happens? Lord prayed for him again. There's the sight. Why did Jesus do things different ways? He said, well, I only do what I see the Father doing. So in the Lord, we've got to throw out God always does it a certain way. No, God can do it any way he wants to. And John said in the end of his book, the Gospel of John, he said, I suppose if everything Jesus did were written down in books, there wouldn't be enough books in the world to contain it all. Isn't that what the Word says? So what? We don't know how many different ways Jesus prayed over the blinds. We don't know. So what, what does that mean? We need to really tune into the Holy Spirit to find out exactly how he wants something done. Wisdom says, come, let me teach you. 
What does the book of Proverbs say? Wisdom cries out in the streets. Come on. Wisdom cries out in the streets. How many are willing to receive that? Amen. So let me say this again. Wisdom gives us the counsel in every situation to know what to do, to know how to do it, to know when to do it. Now I find it amazing, hallelujah, mm, whoo, I just feel the presence of the Lord. What the Word says in Luke chapter 4 about Jesus. Let's go to Luke chapter 4. I want you to see something. Luke chapter 4. Now in, in Luke chapter 4, we're going to find something that I think is really going to touch us when it comes to understanding the wisdom of God. How many love the Lord? Now notice what the Word says in Luke chapter 4. We're going to start in verse 18. The Word of God says this, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because He has anointed me to preach the divine enabling, to preach the good news to the poor, he has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery for the sight of the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. That's Isaiah 61, 1 to 2. Then he rolled up the scroll and he gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fashioned on him. And he began saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing now notice verse 22 all spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips and what did they say isn't this joseph's son they asked isn't this joseph's son they asked what was jesus flowing in there he was flowing in wisdom he was flowing in the divine enabling. And what were they saying? Who is this? Isn't this the Joseph's son? Who is this? Remember when Jesus was 12 years old and he was at the temple and he was teaching from the scriptures in the temple at 12 years old and the word says they marveled at him. What was that? That was wisdom speaking through him. At 12 years old, covered in the spirit of wisdom, he was instructing the instructors. He was preaching to the preachers. He was ministering to the priests. How many are willing to receive that? Hallelujah. Now it's very interesting that the book of Proverbs talks about the wisdom of God very very intensely and often and it's very interesting if you study wisdom in the book of proverbs the word says that there's four main benefits of wisdom one is instruction if you're a note taker the word says in the book of proverbs wisdom will instruct you or be your instructor that's Proverbs chapter 1, verses 2 to 3. The Word also says that a benefit of wisdom is an outpouring of God on your life. That's Proverbs 1, verses 20 to 23. Proverbs also says with wisdom comes protection. That's Proverbs 1, verses uh, verse 33 and the word also says with wisdom comes long life that's proverbs chapter 3 verses 13 to 16 how many are willing to receive that in fact let's go real quick to the book of proverbs and in the book of proverbs let's go to chapter 1 Proverbs chapter 1. How many are enjoying the teaching on the Holy Spirit tonight? Amen? Now notice what the Word says in Proverbs 1. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, for attaining wisdom. We're just in chapter 1 and verse 2, 
And Solomon, the wisest man that ever walked the earth other than the Lord Jesus himself, is already talking about wisdom. How many receive that in the Lord? For attaining wisdom and discipline, for understanding words of insight, for acquiring a discipline and prudent life, doing what is right and just and fair, for giving prudence to the simple and knowledge and discretion to the young. Let the wise listen and add to their learning. What does that mean? You've never got the market cornered on wisdom. Let the wise continue to be teachable and listen and add to their learning and let the discerning get guidance for understanding proverbs and parables, the sayings and riddles of the wise. Now notice verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools, isn't that interesting? But fools despise wisdom and discipline. Now what is knowledge? Knowing. So the word says, hallelujah, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowing God. And what did Jesus do? He delighted in the fear of the Lord. Remember Isaiah 11. How many are excited about the Lord tonight? Amen? Now what is the key to flowing in wisdom? I know we've talked about wisdom for about two sessions. So we could spend the rest of tonight on wisdom alone. But we've talked a lot about wisdom. What is the key to flowing in the spirit of wisdom? We must seek wisdom diligently. We must seek wisdom diligently. You don't become wise in a part-time pursuit of wisdom. You become wise with a full-time pursuit of wisdom. Proverbs says we should devote ourselves to wisdom. In fact, Proverbs says wisdom is the principal thing Therefore, get wisdom, and in all thy getting, get understanding. How many are receiving that in the Lord? So what did Solomon say? He said, wisdom's the principal thing. He said, it's the main thing. He said, well, we know God. He said, we need to seek the wisdom of God. Because in the wisdom of God, we're then going to know what to do. We're going to know when to do it. We're going to know how to do it. Wisdom teaches us what to do with the Word of God and the gifts of God and the resources God gives us like finances and talents and abilities. How many are willing to receive those in the Lord? Now again, I find it fascinating that in, in, in Isaiah 11, the Word first talks about the Spirit of the Lord, meaning the Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit, then the Lord starts talking about wisdom. From there, if we go back to Isaiah 11, I want you to see something, and this is so important in the Lord. Again, do we believe that the word is intentional? Amen? God doesn't put lists in the word, just throw a list in there. God does things every, God does everything in order, Amen? So the word says in Isaiah 11, 2, the spirit of the Lord will rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding. Now in the word, the word understanding also means revelation. So we're going to call this the spirit of revelation. Can I hear an amen? Wisdom and revelation are co-spirits. Throughout the word of God, we see what I like to call divine pairings. Wisdom and revelation are divine pairing. Now, how many know the enemy is the great counterfeiter? He has his less than divine pairings. Okay, Ahab and Jezebel being one of them. Is anybody catching this? So, wisdom and revelation are co-spirits. When we get a revelation of something, we're looking into something hidden that's always been there, 
But now we're seeing it for the first time. But how many know when you get a revelation, you might not know what to do with it. You don't understand it. That's when the co-spirit of wisdom comes to you and says, let me teach you. Let me show you what this means. Is anybody willing to receive that? So it's like John getting the revelation from God that we call the book of Revelation. And he would see something and not get it. And the angel next to him would say, do you want me to explain this to you? Or he would look at the angel and say, could you explain this to me? Daniel did it. Come on now. Hallelujah. Those that received many times deep revelation in the word would look at an angel and say, what does this mean? I, I, I don't get it. I got the revelation, but I need the wisdom to unlock it. What good is a revelation if you don't get it? If you don't understand what to do with it? So this is one of the neatest definitions of revelation that I have ever heard. Revelation means to bring to light and unveil hidden things. To take the cover off or to disclose. Again, revelation means to bring to light and unveil hidden things. To take the cover off or to disclose. A disclosure of what? The secrets of the Lord. The secrets of the Lord. Did everybody receive that? Okay. Now we see certain men and women in the word that received great revelation. But not everybody does. How many know not everybody got the revelation that Daniel walked in? Not everybody got the kind of revelation that Paul walked in. Not everybody got the kind of revelation that John the Beloved walked in. We've got to understand that. There are some folks that prophesied, but it didn't really seem like they got revelation. How many want the revelation of the Lord? Amen? Well, you're never going to get revelation if you don't seek wisdom first. Why? Well, Isaiah 11 mentions wisdom before revelation. We need to diligently seek wisdom first. As we do, God will then begin to give us revelation. How many are willing to receive that? Now, how many want some little deeper teaching in the Lord tonight? Amen. If this hadn't been deep enough for us yet. The word mentions there's two types of revelation. There's prophetic revelation and there's divine revelation. There's prophetic revelation and there's divine revelation. How many are excited about the Lord? Okay. Now, I want to show you something here that I think you're going to find quite interesting in the Lord. And I want to put it on the screen so we can see it. So, Cindy, could you give us, please, Job 33, and we're going to look at verses 14 to 16. So, I want everybody to see this. Job 33, verses 14 to 16. Now, folks, the Word says, how is anyone going to know unless there's someone to teach them? The fact that you're sitting under this teaching is going to open up the door for you to begin the flow in what you're being taught. <laughs> That's why this teaching is so important. Now I want you to notice what, what is spoken here. For God does speak now one way, now another, though man may not perceive it. In a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falls on men as they slumber in their beds. He may speak in their ears and terrify them with warnings. Let's go to the next verse, Cindy. To turn man from wrongdoing and keep him from pride. To preserve his soul from the pit, his life from perishing by the sword. What is that? 
prophetic revelation. Prophetic revelation. Now I find it very interesting that Job says that may come in the form of a dream. That may come in the form of a vision. He says it could be a warning. Now I find it very interesting that Cindy flows in this very anointing. Cindy has dreams and many times they're warning dreams. And she'll come to me and she'll say, Pastor, I had another dream. And I'll go, okay, let me sit down. But what's going on? And many times it's warning dreams. And sometimes in those dreams, she'll not only get the revelation, but she'll get the wisdom that goes with it. She'll say, this is what God showed me in the dream. And this is now what he told me we should do so, so it doesn't happen the way I saw it happen in the dream. And in the times that we've done what God has said, we've avoided the negative things she saw in the dream. In the times that we've gone, oh, that's just a little bit of undigested pepperoni pizza from the night before. I don't think that's really God. Guess what happens? Exactly what God said was going to happen. In fact, she has heard things said word for word in dreams that then she'll hear said word for word in the natural. Isn't that interesting? What is that? A, a prophetic dream. What is prophecy? Prophecy gives us insight into something that is to come. Gives us insight into something that is to come. Why does the word say that comes? Well, it can come to preserve. <laughs> it can come to protect us. It can come to keep us safe. Can I hear an amen? Prophetic revelation can be God showing us what the enemy wants to do. And then the spirit of wisdom says, now let me tell you how you should do it so this doesn't happen. Has anybody ever had that kind of experience before? It may not have been in, in a dream or in a vision, but you just knew you needed to do something in a certain way. Okay, That's prophetic revelation. Now the second I find to be very, very interesting, and that's divine revelation. Divine revelation is a piece of knowledge imparted to your spirit about something that you didn't know before. Let me say that again. Divine revelation is a piece of knowledge imparted in your spirit about something that you didn't know before. Well, how in the world do I know this? I've never studied it. I've never understood it. It's divine revelation from God. Can I hear an amen? I read one time about a gentleman who worked for a company. It's an engineering company. He was not in an engineering role. One night he went to bed and he had a dream. And in that dream God gave him the design for something. Not an engineer. He woke up, took out a sheet of paper and a pencil and drew out that design on that piece of paper he then went to one of the engineers at the company and showed him that engineer looked at it and said where did you get this he said well you're probably not going to believe it if i told you you know where this came from and and the engineer from his company says this is the answer to a problem that we've been trying to solve here at our company but we haven't been able to solve it how did you get this the guy had no engineering degree, had never created a blueprint, had never designed anything. What was that? Divine revelation. Is that not powerful? Divine revelation. So that divine revelation is giving you insight into something that you didn't know before. That you didn't understand before. I've read in other cases of God giving people inventions in their sleep. I mean, just giving them the divine of something. Some churches would call that witty inventions. You've never invented anything in your life. Somebody goes to sleep and God gives them a download for a book and they wake up and over a series of nights they write this book that God gave them. What is that? Divine revelation. It's the musician who's never written a song before. They've only sung other people's songs. They wake up one morning after an encounter with this, in their sleep with the Lord and they're just singing a song. Where did that song come from? It's divine revelation from the Lord. Whitney on our retreat recently was talking about that. 
Neil, God gave me this song. I just woke up and I started singing it. That's divine revelation, which tells me what? Many times we pass things off that are really God giving us revelation, but we just kind of brush it off. Is anybody willing to receive that? Now let's go to Galatians chapter 1, and I want to show you something here. And I just declare in the name of the Lord that, hallelujah, glory, mm, you're going to begin walking in these things that we're studying. Now Paul really nails down for us in Galatians 1 what divine revelation really is. And Holy Spirit, I just ask that you'd release over this group an anointing for prophetic revelation and divine revelation. Even as we study, Holy Spirit, I ask for the impartation and the wisdom to go with the revelation. Teach us, Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Okay, does so everybody have Galatians chapter 1? The Word of God says in Galatians chapter 1 and verse 11, and you may see this verse like you've never seen it before as we study it tonight. Paul says this, I want you to know, brothers, that the gospel I preached is not something that man made up. I didn't receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. Did Paul walk with Jesus during Jesus' earthly ministry? No. We don't see Paul show up until the New Testament church starts to explode. And now this fellow shows up who's Pharisee of Pharisees, lawyer of lawyers. He's got a government job. I mean, this guy is well-educated. But he's clueless to the gospel. When did Jesus give him the revelation that he would call the gospel? I believe he gave it to him when he knocked him off the horse. I really believe that that's when God gave it to him. Okay. Who are, who are you, Lord, and what do you want? Well, Paul, let's talk about that. I really believe that God gave him that revelation when he knocked him off his high horse. And God struck him with blindness, and God dealt with it. I also believe that's why Paul looked at the gospel differently. Now grab a hold of this. I believe this is why Paul looked at the gospel differently than the other apostles did. Well, pastor, what do you mean? The other, the other apostles preached the gospel. Paul called it his gospel. He'd say, my gospel. Why would he say that? Because he was Jesus? No. Paul wasn't crucified. No, what Paul was saying was God gave him a revelation and that revelation was the gospel. Is that not amazing? He'd never read it. He didn't hear Jesus teach it. Nobody testified to him of it. What happened? I believe God knocked him off the horse and gave him the download and he got it. Is that not amazing? That is, hallelujah, the divine revelation of God. How many want that? <laughs> Where you just have an encounter with God and you come out of that encounter knowing something you didn't know before. Whoo! Would that not be incredible in the Lord? I, uh, I read one time about a Christian fellow who uh, was a pastor yeah, he wasn't just a pastor, he was saved, hallelujah, and uh, a little bit of church humor on a Wednesday night, and uh, he evidently was in an accident, died uh, in the ambulance on the way to the hospital, got to the hospital and they revived him. Well, how many know time in the spirit realm is so much different than time here on earth? He said that he had a chance to see heaven in that time, and he said when he saw heaven, he said he walked into heaven and he saw like a little amphitheater. And in that amphitheater, he said someone was teaching and people were all around that amphitheater theater listening. And he said in heaven, nobody spoke with their mouth. You just kind of looked at each other and you knew. And he said the moment he looked at who was teaching, he knew it was the Apostle Paul. And he said... He wondered what Paul was doing, 
And he said he looked around and he said Paul looked right at him and said to him, what you don't learn on earth, you have to learn in heaven. And then he said Paul looked at him very intently and said to him, are you still preaching my gospel? Isn't that interesting? Why did Paul hold the gospel so close? Because it was given to him by divine revelation. Which means what? When God gives you rhema directly, it always is more valuable to you than what you glean from someone else's. That's why we shouldn't just be satisfied reading Christian books. We should want to walk in what we're reading so we can get divine revelation from the Lord. And by the way, divine revelation, and you've heard me say this before, is progressive. You get the revelation and wisdom shows you what to do with it, how to do it, how to apply it. Can I hear an amen? Then God shows you more. It's progressive. Wisdom teaches you. God shows you more. Wisdom teaches you. How many know when Paul got the download on the gospel, he got the revelation, but wisdom probably taught him over years' time. Come on now. What he saw, what he heard, what he received. So God can literally come over us and bam, hit us with a download of divine revelation. Is that not cool? Now I want you to grab a hold of this. Wisdom and revelation partner together. Wisdom helps you apply what revelation shows you. But if you don't have wisdom, you don't know what to do with the divine revelation. So let me read this again. Wisdom and revelation are a divine pairing. Wisdom helps you apply what revelation shows you. But if you don't have wisdom, you don't know what to do with divine revelation. <coughs> so let me ask you a question. Why would God ever give you divine revelation if you don't have wisdom? So we need to seek wisdom first if we want to walk in deeper gifts like divine revelation. Is anybody receiving this? Well, you could say now if he got on the road the divine revelation that is the gospel as he was going to persecute Christians, it was the road to where? Where was he going to persecute? Absolutely, Damascus. Absolutely, was knocked off his horse given divine revelation. Well, you may say, well, why would God do that without giving him wisdom first? No, he was a scholar of the scripture. He was taught in the Word. He had wisdom in the Scriptures. He just didn't know who God was. But he had wisdom. He didn't have knowledge. So what happened when he got the revelation? He got the knowledge. And the wisdom helped unlock it. Does that make sense? So we've got to see it for what it is. I believe that, that Solomon said wisdom is the principal thing because he knew with wisdom then everything else comes. Without wisdom, God's not going to trust you with the keys to the car. Amen? With wisdom, you get the keys to the car. Now, what is the key to flowing in revelation? Well, up to this point, we've talked about the key to flowing in the Spirit of the Lord. It's yieldedness. We've talked about the key to flowing in the Spirit of wisdom. And that was to seek it diligently. There are many in the church that will stop at wisdom. Because when you go beyond wisdom, it really begins to cost you. Let me say that again. When you go beyond wisdom and start seeking the, the deeper manifestations of of the Spirit of God. And I'm not saying that wisdom is a shallow manifestation. It all comes through wisdom. But if you really want to go deeper than the shallow teachings of the church, if you really want to go deeper than what you've known of the Word, it will cost you. 
So to flow in the, the spirit of revelation, you have to go to God's school of humility and brokenness. You have to go to God's school of humility and brokenness. Now think about it. Look at the men in the word that walked in surpassing great revelation. One of them was Paul. Did Paul get humbled? All the time. Did Paul, was Paul broken? All the time. Remember, this was the man who was thrown out of cities and, and literally stoned to death and left for dead. How many times did that happen? Over and over in the word again. And what would he do? Get up and go back into that very city and minister. He was flogged, he was beaten, he was whipped, he was eventually martyred for the sake of God. But what did Paul say? Paul said that God keeps me humble in the midst of surpassing great revelation. How did God do it? Through humility and brokenness. Paul talks about the thorn. We don't know what the thorn was necessarily. When he talks about the thorn in his flesh, that helped keep him humble. But we know there was something there. We know there was something there. So if you really want to flow in the revelation of God, you've got to be willing to allow God to take you through humbling and through brokenness. Remember what Paul said? He said, Lord, I want to know you not only in the power of your resurrection, but also in the fellowship of your suffering. Why would a man ever say that? Reminds me of Brent. Every once in a while, God will speak something to me for Brent, and I'll bring it up in a conversation. And right after I bring it up, he'll say, why did you say that? Well, <laughs> God said it. That's why I said it. See, we've got to understand when it, when it comes to this, if we want the deeper things of God, we've got to get the revelation that Paul got and that is, it's one thing to flow in the power. It's another thing to flow in the revelation. And he knew revelation only came through suffering. Lord, I want to know you not only in the power of your resurrection, but in the fellowship of your suffering. Why would you ever volunteer for that? Because in the suffering comes revelation. Is anybody willing to receive that? In the suffering comes the revelations. He understood that. He understood that the Christian walk was not a pleasure cruise. He understood it was a battered lifeboat. He understood it for what it was. So how many here want to walk in divine revelation in the Lord? It will cost you. It will cost you. It will cost you. You see, you've got to yield to the Lord. You've got to seek his wisdom diligently. And then you have to be willing to be broken and walk in humility to get the revelation. Why does God want you to walk in brokenness and humility in order to receive the revelation? So that we don't come into a into a uh, situation that medical doctors would call largest craniumus or ever expandus craniumus. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? It's the humility and the suffering that keeps us from getting a big head when it comes to the revelation. We get revelation through suffering. Can I hear an amen? We get revelation through suffering. How many are willing to receive that in the Lord? Amen. So how many want to go deeper in him? How many want the dreams and visions? How many want the deeper things of God? If that's your heart, God wants to take you to those places. But we have to be willing to be humbled and to be broken. That is where you begin to walk out of the traditional church as we know it and into the church that's truly the remnant because the remnant is willing to be broken. That's why Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I but Christ liveth in me. If you want that revelation, we have to be broken. Well, I only know if the Apostle Paul who really got broken over Revelation. Really? 
<coughs> what about the prophet Daniel? Daniel received incredible revelation from God. But guess where he received it? In captivity. Are you willing to receive that? Do you receive that tonight? <clears throat> he was taken away in chains as a teenager and brought